Well, the research context for me was in the 1990s. I was a cognitive psychologist, a psycholinguist. Uh, I was interested in children learning to read and spell, why some children had difficulty to remember dyslexia. And uh, cognitive psychology was a great way, a great framework to think about these issues. Issues of human information processing, of representation, of visual representation and phonological representation. And learning to read is learning the mappings between these. Uh, this was a time when connectionism was at the fore, and the notion that much of human learning is the associative learning of mappings, the statistical mappings between different representation domains. And the idea that what we know comes from our time on task, exploring a particular problem space. So for reading, um, this sort of approach answered so many of the basic fundamental observations. It explained why some words are easier to read than others, why mint is easier to read than pint. It explained why children learned faster to read in some languages than others. Transparent orthographies like Welsh or Italian, it's easier to learn in those um, systems than opaque orthographies like English or French. Um, it explained why some individuals had difficulty learning, so uh, developmental dyslexics with problems with phonological representations have difficulty learning the phonological mappings and therefore have difficulty learning the visual to phonological mappings. And so these insights came from thinking of language as a problem space and thinking of learners cracking their ways into that problem space. Uh, there have been huge breakthroughs in learning to read and spell, the learning of morphology. So thinking in these ways was natural for a cognitive psychologist. But many of my colleagues in second language acquisition and linguistics didn't think like this. Um, they were worried about access to EUG and parameter setting. And this really wasn't um, a natural way of thinking for them. Um, I tried to involve colleagues in projects, looking, for example, at um, corpus investigations of the Welsh language. And I remember coming away from a, a discussion with a colleague, being told that, that linguists hadn't considered frequency since Chomsky 57. Um, so I thought I'd try and write a review, trying to encourage that this was a useful way. If it works for reading and spelling, then natural language generally might be, um, might be a good subject for this type of approach. The problem spaces are different, but the same cognitive mechanisms are involved. So I wrote my review, I submitted it to SSLA, reviewing frequency effects across phonology, reading, spelling, uh, phraseology, syntax, across the broad range of language phenomena. I submitted it to SSLA, I crossed my fingers, and I wondered what they were going to say. Well, it was a review paper, so um, you know, uh, that wasn't surprising. But what was surprising was the reaction to it. Um, about a month after I'd submitted it, um, I was surprised and excited to get a response from the editor, Albert Baldwin, uh, saying uh, that um, he was suggesting that it become a target article for a special issue, and that a number of senior members in the field could well act as commentators, uh, responding to it, and then there would be some opportunity for me to respond to the commentaries. So uh, that was a surprise. I wasn't expecting it. Um, trepidation, uh, opportunity, happiness, all of those sorts of reactions. Um, but it was a great opportunity. So I expanded the paper somewhat in that light, um, considering more implications for acquisition, for sociolinguistics, for implicit and explicit learning, and for instruction. And um, it, was, it was good to go back to it yet again and realize that there was one fundamental conclusion, and that was if all aspects of language processing uh, show sensitivity to frequency effects, then where does this sensitivity come from? Well, it must come from, from practice, from usage, from time on task. It means that language acquisition in all of those domains is usage driven. Um, so that was my great insight. 
Um, and then there were the commentators, and I was really pleased that Albert Waldman as editor, and then Kathleen Barbie Harnig, Doug Biber, Randy Reppen, Robert Bly Roman, Jim Bybee, Rod Ellis, Lynn Eubank, and Kevin Gregg, Sue Gass and Alison Mackey, Michael Harrington and Simon Dennis, Jan Hildstein, Diane Larson Freeman, and Elaine Theroux. So they all wrote commentaries. Um, the evaluative aspects of those commentaries. Um, uh, one quotation is, is, the implications of this new linguistic theory for our understanding of first and second language acquisition will be profound. Um, others said, although we find ourselves in general agreement um, with the importance of frequency in SLA, we suggest a complex task lies ahead. Um, making sense of it, someone else said, requires a much longer story. And there were also comments like, his accounts of these um, areas are risibly inadequate. So it was a full range of, of, um, of, of reactions, um, which I think was very fair. Um, and the details of the commentaries, the details, the substance of them, um, were really useful. They made me think a lot about a range of different areas. And they allowed me to write a 42-page reflections after the commentaries, which is nowadays less well, less well cited. But um, it was a very good stepping stone in, in the development of my thinking, particularly with regard when frequency fails to drive learning, implicit and explicit learning as complementary mechanisms, the role of attention and form-focused instruction, saliency, memorized phraseology in the learning process, probabilistic grammar, all of those areas. It was a real boom to get this sort of breadth of feedback, um, and these issues have filled my research agenda for the last 15 years or so. So, so thanks to SSLA and thanks to Albert Feldman. It was, it was a great experience. Well, these ideas had had a huge impact on me, and they're current in cognitive science more generally. Um, second language acquisition is a fascinating and important um, subject area, so putting the two together, and I was, I was hopeful. And it's certainly the case that the field has moved on tremendously in the last 15 years or so. It's a much broader discipline now. Um, it's great to see the collaborations with cognitive linguistics, with corpus linguistics, with psycholinguistics. Um, thinking about learning from usage, but usage broadly defined, not just the, the cognitive usage, but the social aspects of usage too. So here we are, 2018, um, SLA has had the social turn. Um, there have been some really useful collaborations across cognition and social approaches. More recently, a couple of years ago, the um, Douglas Fir Group paper published in, in uh, Modern Language Journal. Um, I've been continuing exploring these areas too. So with Uta Rema and Matt O'Donnell, um, in 2016, we published uh, a book on usage-based approaches to language acquisition and processing. I've just finished a paper, um, Essentials of the Theory of Language Cognition, which is going to be published in MLJ next year. Um, I think these are exciting times. If you're interested in any of the things that I've written, then Google Nick Ellis and SLA, and you'll get to my homepage, where you can download a lot of these articles, or look on the University of Michigan Deep Blue article repository, and you can find things there, or drop me an email, and I should be